There we go. Okay, I'm going to start again. So, Laura, if you want to just make it say hi real quick. Uh, and are you sharing the slides again? Yes, I will. Excellent. So, Good. hi again. I'm Laura Rennick. I am the uh, with Weave, the Western Interstate Energy Board. Um, we exist to support the states in um, electricity. Um, Issue, broadly electricity issues. I'll, I'll speak more to some of the specifics of what we're working on. Um, so while Vicki is pulling up the slides, um, my goal today is really to give you um, a, a high level overview of regionalization efforts in the West. And then um, Stacy and Ryan can both speak in more detail to the California ISO's work, as well as the Western Resource Adequacy Program work. Um, and then we also have with us Kathleen Sachs and Nicole Hughes, who can speak more to the benefits, um, both on the policy front, as well as for customers of these different efforts. Um, so, Vicki, when you're ready, I'm on slide three. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, and, and Stacy has it, Stacy will talk on this a little bit, so I'll be really brief, but basically um, just kind of an overview for you of traditional uh, market models and functions. And as you move from the left to the right of this chart, you see the addition of an independent system operator um, as well as um, the various functions that start to evolve in this incremental process towards RTO. Uh, next slide. And I, is it okay if I make these slides available, Laura? Yes, that's okay. That's great. great. I'll help. Um, and so, so as we think about an RTO, because it was kind of what Vicky wanted us to focus on or what, what Vicky asked me to focus on, some of the primary functions. I think um, many of you are familiar with these, but we have the real-time market um, for the security-constrained economic dispatch of those generation resources. We're moving into uh, the development of the day-ahead markets um, for the unit commitment, you know, as well as the um, planning reserves margin through re resource adequacy programs. And then the next... Yes. Laura, if I might, on this picture, what I think so interesting is if you looked at MISO or the or the um, the power pool in the east, that would be all one color. And you see how many different banking authorities we have with each utility, which does not create that one market. So just I think the picture does a nice job of showing that. Thanks. Uh, excellent. Yes, the 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 picture on that slide. Um, really is is one of those kind of standard images that's shown to demonstrate how the West is unique. And, and I have another one of those in a, in a moment. But so as we think about um, some of the goals of market expansion, I think Nicole and Kathleen will touch on this as well. We obviously have the, uh, the least cost um, that those economic factors, we have the reliability and the improved situational awareness. And by, um, by moving into a larger geographic footprint, we're able to take advantage of a diversity of resources to serve load. Um, and that positions us to um, achieve decarbonization goals more broadly because we have this bigger pool on which to draw, um, as well as, of course, transparency. Uh, I came you know, from, from the state of Montana, which um, is a uh, generation exporting state. And so, you know, none of us are operating in a vacuum and being able to have that transparency and that understanding of the broader system and where things are and where they're going you know, is, is really helpful, both from an operations as well as kind of a policy standpoint as well. Laura, Next if slide, I might please. ask a question on this too, in your um, key, your legend here, mm -hmm. it shows California is the non-wrap area, but it shows the dark as wrap. So is Arizona, that part of Arizona is already in the wrap? Um, I can I can clarify that. Um, sorry, the, the slide doesn't specifically tie to the language here, um, but I think that's probably something that Ryan is is really equipped to to speak to. Okay. Okay. We'll wait for the suspense. <laughs> Okay, so and, and then this slide, I really, I really appreciate the satellite image of the the lower forty eight. It really demonstrates to me um, how visually how different the West really is from the other two thirds half of the country. You can see the Rocky Mountains, you can see the um, Central Valley in California, and 
um, the Great Basin. It's it's a massive land area. It's a massive footprint. There's a lot of diversity, both in terms of climate, geography, uh, political diversity, cultural diversity, and so I think when I think one of the one of the core kind of basic goals or um, opportunities here is that when you when you think about this expanded footprint to cover this unique and vast geographic area, it's really an opportunity for more win-win scenarios from everything from those cost savings for consumers to the climate goals and a more resilient system overall. So next slide. So in thinking about that and the current efforts um, at play in the West, uh, we have uh, the California ISO extended day ahead market, Stacy can speak to that. Um, we have the Southwest Power, Power Pools Market Plus, this group um, just recently heard from them. And we have the Western Power Pools uh, Resource Adequacy Program and Ryan is here. So you have, you have a great lineup today to, to talk um, more in depth on all of these efforts. And the fourth one here is this Western Markets Exploratory Group. And this is a group of utilities that have um, kind of joined together to discuss markets um, amongst themselves. Um, there's, so there's clearly a need for groups with similar interests um, and roles to be played to have conversations uh, about these various efforts. And so thinking about that, um, you can go to the next slide. And that brings me to WEAB and where WEAB kind of fits in with us. And as a, um, as a regional entity that serves the entire Western Interconnect, WEAB has the staff, the resources through MOUs and funding agreements to support these to support states' involvement in these various efforts. And so um, this is a list of some of the um, committees that are both within WEAB or adjacent to WEAB that we've staff support. And if you go to the next slide, I just wanna highlight a couple of those for you today. Um, that's the uh, the green one here is the body of state regulators and this is a this is an organization this is a group um, that was um, stood up to support the development of the Western uh, EIM um, to work with Kaiso on that and is now and that's and Weeb has stepped in to provide staff support for the bot there, um, but was really a part of those initial conversations or a forum for those initial conversations in the development of the Western EIM uh, prior to there being a bosser. And so the bosser is a forum um, of the commissioners from the state um, uh, represented by or captured within the Western EIM. And, and those commissioners are also now tracking um, with the bosser the EDAM proposal, the extended day ahead market proposal. Um, we're also now staffing through a yeah. uh, an MOU agreement, the Western Resource Adequacy Programs Committee of State Representatives. <laughs> um, we're, we're great great at acronyms, but this is another group that's focused specifically on that RAP program. Um, so, so we provides the staff support, the ability to track these different initiatives, engage with um, the operators, the program developers, and provide um, provide those resources back to the state, that analysis, that um, summarization, and then um, provide comments if there's a desire from the state to provide comments um, back to the development well, we work on those. And so I think the, the other one that I wanna highlight here that was on the previous slide is the um, is CREPSI and CREPSI and YRAB um, have um, for years uh, for um, ha hosted a biennial um, gathering of the state energy officials and the utility commissioners across the West, as well as other NGOs, utilities, um, market participants um, to have these conversations. And so if you go to the next slide, I just want to offer a save the date for everyone. Um, in two weeks, we will be hosting our fall. We host this in the fall and the spring. We'll be hosting our fall meeting in Tempe. And the agenda is, um, is full of these conversations in more detail. Um, the logistics of themes issues between uh, the RAP program and the California ISO footprint, um, transmission considerations and concerns. Um, uh, we're, we're working on a panel for that Western Markets Exploratory Group to hear from the utility executives on, on their what they see as the need and how they're um, approaching it. 
And so this is really a forum where where those conversations have happened for years and where we anticipate they'll continue to happen. And so I just I'm here to offer our support and um, make the introduction that we're a resource if you need anything. Um, happy to try to answer any questions or connect you um, to the appropriate individuals if if I'm not able to. So thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much. Those slides are helpful. And I'd ask each of the five speakers to present in about 10 minutes, and you did a good job at that. And then we will have a robust dialogue. If you have a burning question, ask it right now. Otherwise, I'm going to turn it over to um, Ryan Roy. Okay. All right. Next. Next chair. Let's get ready for this. All right. Share screen. Nick Myers is joining us. Awesome. Okay, so I'm going to I'm screen sharing, so I need to stop share. Like, no, I can just open it, right? I think so too. I'm I'll be good at this by the end. All right, so I need oh, this is Nicole's. Yeah. Never mind. wrap there you go there we go we're going to really get into wrap the board had specifically asked to um get into wrap and so we are going to do that all right thanks vicky hopefully you can hear me i'll go ahead and get started uh, i'm ryan roy i'm the director of technology modeling and analytics at the western power pool uh, I'm going to talk today about our uh, Western Resource uh, Adequacy Program. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Vicki. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe by way of a little context here. So I know this sort of discussion is, is focused around, you know, RTOs and markets. And so a sort of a fundamental premise in, in the, the day ahead, real time and, and RTO space is that folks come into uh, the market uh, with sufficient um, uh, resources. And so, you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of, you know, not resource sufficiency uh, in particular, but resource uh, adequacy. So, you know, we really think and believe that there is a big benefit um, to those members, um, you know, considering joining on our program um, to look on a forward basis and ensure that they have uh, procured sufficient capacity to meet a, a reliability metric that we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a second. So we sort of think this forms somewhat of the foundation of that sort of markets and RTO discussion, ensuring that there is sufficient steel in the ground, that when folks turn those light switches on, the lights come on as they would expect, you know, what is relatively or what is becoming viewed as a, a fundamental right. And so that's really what we're trying to address here. How do we ensure that the Western inter Interconnect is a resource adequate in a way that, you know, results in higher reliability for folks and hopefully cost savings uh, for those folks that are participating. So we're gonna do that in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is a binding forward showing. So what this means is two years in advance of the operation uh, binding season, we have two of them, winter and summer. Of course, some are particularly important for folks uh, in Arizona. Um, we are going to run some modeling. We're going to you know, put resources load into the model and we're going to ensure that uh, define the amount of capacity necessary to meet a one event day in 10 year reliability metric. And so uh, we do that in the binding forward showing that's two years in advance of the binding season. That sets the capacity requirement uh, for those folks that are participating, the load serving entities, load responsible entities in our program. Um, we also have a binding operational program. If you've gone through the process of establishing a capacity requirement, you know, properly sizing the need for the region, then there is a requirement, um, you know, this is how we unlock that diversity benefit. You get diversity of resources, diversity of loads on a forward basis, and then sort of our binding operational program uh, is how we unlock that. Now, I want to be careful to say that, that we develop this construct sort of absent a current um, sort of west wide or broad uh, day ahead and real time market. 
And so there are some real efficiencies and benefits to be gained um, by moving to that sort of market construct. But on a forward basis, you know, because we have um, sort of safely lowered the requirements, we're helping you folks through the IRP planning process appropriately at credit resources, we hope we can um, sort of achieve some investment cost savings, that it's better from uh, a Westwide Interconnect perspective to have a broad uh, group of folks uh, addressing resource adequacy, looking at their IRP, their planning processes, understanding what the capacity accreditation of those resources is going to be, and benefiting from sort of the diversity of their neighbors. We have planned for an operations program. That is one way we can unlock that diversity. It certainly could also be gained through the day ahead market construct. So we want to set an appropriate reliability metric. We want to appropriately accredit resources, and we hopefully want to achieve investment cost savings um, for our participants. You should be able to meet this capacity requirement um, with less capacity in a broader group than you can individually. So next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about our forward showing program. So the, the first and kind of key component is the regional reliability metric. You know, what metric are we attempting uh, as a program to achieve? So this is one event day in 10 years loss of load expectation. This is something that is, you know, in the reliability modeling space, a lot of work is going into this, uh, but this is a, a reasonably standard metric and the metric that we have um, chosen. Um, we also have gone through sort of a thoughtful analysis of the hours of greatest need. And so we call these in our program capacity critical hours. So we take a look at what our participants are expected to have installed in terms of resource mix. And we sort of overlay that on top of a historical record. So we can sort of get the benefit of new solar profiles, potentially storage, you know, the impact of wind, all of those things on, on kind of a historical record. And that gives us some indication of, um, you know, based on the historical, historical record, what the hours of greatest need might be. Included in that is, is kind of um, a thoughtful analysis about interchange, trying to understand, for example, um, what would exports to CAISO have looked like? What was import capability? Uh, so that gives us a, a data set that we call our capacity critical hour data set. So we have a reliability metric. We sort of have an understanding of, of the, this is not a fixed number of hours in a day, but the potential hours of greatest need. So then we have to understand the qualifying capacity contribution of those resources. If you've established the reliability metric, if you set a capacity requirement, then we have to understand how those resources stack up against that capacity requirement. And that's done in a couple of different ways. Um, you know, wind, solar, a short-term duration, ESRs, that's a, an effective load carrying capability or ELCC. We have a qualifying capacity contribution methodology for storage hydro, uh, and then and sort of something very similar taking into account historical forced outages uh, for thermal. We are very much resource uh, agnostic, the um, sort of resource planning, the stack, uh, that, that remains with um, the states and the commissions. Um, we determine a planning reserve margin. So once we know what that capacity requirement is, uh, we know what the load was and we can calculate a planning reserve margin. We have a, a monthly PRM for both binding seasons. So the binding seasons incorporate 10 months or nine months of the year. So there's nine planning reserve margins. Uh, that varies by region. We modeled the desert Southwest and Eastern side of our footprint, as well as the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and kind of um, mid-sea regions separately. Ryan, can I interrupt? Absolutely. What, what is the planning reserve margin and how does it compare to what is commonly done today without the RAP program? So it, uh, it really depends. And so there are a good number of our folks that are doing sort of a probabilistic look at a planning reserve margin, you know, sort of a sampling outages, resource performance, and they come up with a number. Um, the idea is that when we do this together, that's say maybe at an 18% planning reserve margin, you know, because on your worst day, maybe your neighbor is having uh, a good day in terms of resource performance or not having outages, maybe their load is slightly lower. Uh, it means we can meet that same reliability metric with a, a lower planning reserve margin. Now, now that all depends on this idea of being able to share the diversity, but that's kind of the idea that 
that you can take a probabilistic look, you can benefit from the diversity of the footprint and lower that planning reserve margin. That's part of the value um, proposition. Thank you. Um, showing requirement includes a deliverability component. So, you know, it's not enough for us from a reliability perspective to say that we have the capacity or have the resources. We also need to be able to get those resources to load. So as part of our program, we do have a firm or conditional firm, a network service would um, count uh, to meet 75% of the P50 plus PRM. So when you show us those resources, you have to be able to get 75% of those uh, resources to that load. And we do have a kind of a robust uh, exception framework. So this does set a, a compliance obligation. Um, uh, you could be subject to cost of new entry penalty if you didn't meet this compliance obligation. And that's set seven months in advance of the binding season. So we do modeling at two years, indicative modeling five years in advance, and then we have uh, uh, seven months in advance of the binding season set that metric. So that's on the forward showing basis. This is all well in advance uh, of the operating day. And it gets to that ensuring that we have sort of sufficient steel in the ground to maintain uh, a reliable system. And, and clarification here. So you determine if there's compliance seven months ahead and if there's not, there's a penalty and how much is that? So there, there's the, the, C, the compliance obligation is seven months in advance of the binding season. You go through the forward showing. If you're notified by the program that you have sort of insufficient capacity or deliverability, there's a cure period. You get a 90-day window in which you can correct that deficiency. Uh, if you do not meet that, either for the, the capacity or the transmission component, it's a cost of new entry. It's a multiplier of a cost of new entry. So 91 cents uh, a kilowatt, 9181 a kilowatt year. And so it's really sort of the cost of uh, a peaking gas plant with a multiple. So uh, SPP, for example, in their footprint has never actually charged this. It's not meant to be an economic option. It's really meant to be uh, a deterrent. Got it. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the operations program. So as many of you well know, and I think it's part of the reason why the collective is here, we're operating in a you know, largely um, contract path based and bilateral uh, market with the exception of the EIM. Uh, of course, uh, you know, our colleagues at the CAISO, colleagues at the SPP are working on this problem, but absent uh, sort of a market construct, we needed some way to share that diversity on the operating day. And so we have developed a program. I think it remains to be seen you know, how, how this will be utilized given sort of the push for a West by day head market, but it does exist. This is the way that we would unlock the diversity absent that market construct. So we have our expectation or what we assumed in the forward showing, and then we sort of look at the operational reality. So we made some assumptions in the forward showing about your load, the resource performance, um, outages. So the way that it works, if for example, your load is coming in low, your VARES are overperforming, you may be surplus uh, on the operating day. Somebody else may have, you know, cloud cover, um, uh, really high load, you know, may significant unit outages. So they may be deficit. And the operations program is set up to pair the deficit and surplus folks such that that diversity can be exchanged. Uh, if you are surplus, this calculation sort of obligates you uh, to share that surplus um, uh, with the deficit entities. Um, this forecast of who's surplus and deficit starts on a seven day ahead and is locked in on, on the pre-scheduled day. So your requirement or obligation to the program uh, is set on the pre-scheduled day. It can certainly go down, but it cannot go up. Um, those folks that are surplus and, and have an obligation to the program, uh, if they do not uh, meet that obligation, they might be subject to uh, energy delivery failure charge. So we really want to ensure that if you're a surplus entity with an obligation to the program, that you're fulfilling that obligation. And again, because some of our participants here are more familiar with the retail markets, and this is more a, a you know, a wholesale market issue, you compared for us that saving, like if there was a reserve margin requirement that was 18% in one area and 13% in another, you could lower the average because of the coordination of 
a bigger geography. Here with regard to penal or the um, the energy delivery failure charge, how would that compare again to the way things are done today? Well, I guess you could think of this uh, on the wholesale market side as something like uh, liquidated damages, for example. If you had an expectation of delivery, that delivery wasn't met, you know, there may be sort of liquidated damages associated with that. This is really, you know, we've all are signing up for this program sort of together. The idea is that if I'm, say, APS, and I know Brian and Tyler are here, uh, if, if they have confidence that they've lowered their planning reserve margin, they've done that you know, sort of with the assurance that on that operating day, if somebody else isn't struggling, sort of like APS may be, that they're going to have access um, to that capacity and energy if necessary. So, you know, they're, they're lowering that plan and reserve margin, counting on their neighbor delivering uh, on that out, sort of hour of greatest need. So, so to that extent, it, it's really critically important that if you have an obligation to the program, that you satisfy that obligation. And that's really the reason for the energy delivery failure charge. Okay. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about timelines here. Um, so we have, and we'll see this on the next slide, but we have filed our tariff. Uh, we filed that on the last day of August and the comment period ends uh, the last day of September with FERC. And, and in that we have kind of described this um, transition to a binding operations program. So we're in a um, non-binding forward showing now. We've done our first round of modeling for 2020 three, 24, and 26, 27. So it's okay, the previous slide will work just fine. Oh, I was trying to admit someone, but you can't do it that way. Anyway, keep going. So we're in a non-binding forward showing now. It's actually due uh, today on the 15th. So we've gone through the first round of data collection, the first round of modeling. Folks are submitting their forward showing for that winter um, uh, time period. Um, and, and so that's kind of where we're at currently with, with um, the program. We would then transition into a non-binding operations program. So this is really going to give our participants a, a feel for how the operations program could work um, if necessary. Now we've got a couple of transition seasons. You know, there are some folks in our program who have say traditionally relied on um, the day ahead market. Remember we're asking them you know, seven months in advance of that binding season to show that they're resource adequate. This is really on a forward basis. So there are some folks in the program who have a bit of work to do uh, to meet you know, the potential standard. And because of that, we've sort of introduced these transition seasons starting in summer 2025 and ending in winter 27, 28. So when folks sign up for the program, they can select which season they would like to go binding. And then from 2028 on, uh, those would be kind of fully binding. So there's a period um, to allow folks to get comfortable with the operations program, you know, finish those build, builds if they have it. If they're in sort of procure mode, give them an opportunity um, to, uh, to procure the necessary resources. So we wanted to be thoughtful about this transition from non-binding um, to binding. And so finally here, uh, I noted that we did file with FERC on August 31st. Um, from, a, from the perspective of, you know, kind of the program, we are asking for um, signups for the next phase, you know, uh, the binding participation with the transition that I talked about um, at the end of the year. Um, and so the, the question was asked, um, uh, we are getting participation um, in this phase from uh, APS, I know Brian and Tyler are on, and SRP. So uh, we have um, some Desert Southwest uh, participation, which we have um, uh, greatly appreciated. Certainly the resource mix is, is much different on the desert southwest and eastern side of the footprint. Um, so they are participating. Like other folks, uh, they'll have a decision to make um, at the end of the year about participation. So I'll, I'll pause there and and see if there's any questions. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to admit this individual while anybody have a question of Ryan, because um, maybe when you hear it all, you'll something will come to mind. Uh, hi, yes, uh, this is Kevin Higgins. Thank you, Ryan, for the presentation. Uh, regarding the ELCCs that you've been calculating, is there 
a place on uh, your website where one could go to see what those uh, at least tentatively are for uh, different resources? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So uh, we're having a webinar on this information on the 20th. And so then we would sort of release the data after that. We, we did make the request to our participants. We've got sort of a package that we've put together. And so you can expect to see that in the next couple of weeks. And, and um, my email's on there. And if you, if you send me a message, I'd love to send you the, the webinar information because we'll walk through it then and then you'll be able to see uh, sort of the full package. So yeah, we're, we're going to share those sort of by season, by resource, so folks can get a feel for uh, what those look like. There's one slight um, thing to note here is that we do kind of an average ELCC by zone, by month, and by resource class. The, the megawatt ELCC value is then allocated to uh, individual resources based on past performance. So it's indicative, but you know, wouldn't map exactly to say looking at a solar farm in your backyard, but very close. Uh, what what time on uh, the twentieth uh, is that webinar, Ryan? Um, you know, if you send me an email uh, or put your email in the chat, I'll ha happily get back to you on that. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Uh, appreciate that, and that's open to the public. Abs yes, absolutely. Um, this probably goes without saying, but but transparency is critically important for us. So yes, please, we would love to have the participation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Oh, go ahead. Uh, David Getz has a question here. Yeah, Ryan, this is David Getz at Southwestern Power. What is the linkage or thinking around the ability of a participant who has surplus and is required to, you know, say, deliver to a, a neighbor in need or another member. What's the linkage you're thinking about the uh, availability of transmission to do that? So the, that's a good question. So we've really done two different things. In the Pacific Northwest and Mid-Sea region, we have folks have good connectivity to a physical, you know, the Mid-Sea physical kind of trading hub. And so they're going to exchange through there. We don't have that luxury in the desert Southwest. So we've actually come up with an EIM-like mechanism whereby folks self-submit the points at which they can take receipt, the points at which they can deliver, and the amount of that transfer capability so that we can match folks up um, in an optimized way. And so part of what we're trying to learn out of the non-binding uh, operations program is how well do those assumptions about the ability to share diversity in that region hold up. Uh, you know, understandably, some of our folks are pretty nervous about lowering a planning reserve margin if they don't have confidence that they could, could actually get the delivery absent a market construct. So we've tried to be very thoughtful about that. It's something we're concerned about. You know, we work very closely with Brian on this issue. Uh, we need to figure out whether, you know, the assumptions that we've made hold up so that there is that confidence in the lower PRM. Thank you. Amanda, you have a question? Yes, please. Thank you, I appreciate the presentation. Has there been any consideration about trying to binding program sooner than I think you said 2028 or maybe you said 25? So when you, when you started designing, were you considering binding sooner? Because to me, that's where you really get the benefits and it's pretty far out. That's a, that's a great question, Amanda. Yes, we had originally said that we would have uh, a binding season uh, sort of much sooner than that 2028. The, the fact of the matter is some of the folks do have sort of a long ways to go to, to have those forward resources. You know, they've got, you know, um, projects in the queue waiting to be built. You can't build those overnight. And because the cost of new entry penalty is so high, what we didn't want to have happen was effectively a wealth transfer. And, and so there was a lot of discussion about this. Clearly from a, you know, maybe a reliability perspective, we'd prefer to have that um, you know, sooner than later. But you know, realistically speaking, at, at the way the cost of new entry is, um, there were some uh, organizations, some of our LSEs who, you know, couldn't really be exposed to that risk given long lead times for build, potential problems with procurement. So, so it was a negotiated solution. We thought it was better to keep all you know, the folks at the table in the tent um, participating. And, and most of them frankly are trying to do the right thing. 
Yeah, I understand that. I look at that as lowest common denominator. You're trying to accommodate everybody, so you keep pushing out. And, you know, we have some challenges in the next few years. And so to allow a pram, you know, to wait for everybody to be ready versus start with those that can, you know. Oh, so I yeah, that. I was going to say, so, so folks are going to indicate which season they go binding. Um, when they sign up. And so 2025 will be the first option for a binding season. So it doesn't mean that everybody's waiting towards, you know, until 2028. I think there are going to be some folks that if they sign up would select 2028, but the program will be, be ready, assuming for approval um, that we get folks to sign up. So there is a binding option in 2025. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Okay, thanks, Ryan. And I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end. I want to make sure we have time for that. So let's uh, bring up Nicole. Hi there. Can can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Um, greetings, uh, Nicole Hughes, the Executive Director of Renewable Northwest. Uh, go ahead. Next slide, please. So um, Renewable Northwest is a clean energy advocacy organization. We do work in four states, uh, Oregon, Washington, Montana, Idaho, kind of traditionally the BPA footprint. Uh, we do policy work, uh, regulatory work, and markets and transmission work. Next slide, please. Um, just a quick demonstration of the types of, of organizations that we represent. We represent both the renewable energy industry and some of the supporting organizations, as well as a handful of nonprofit organizations that are uh, interested in the decarbonization value of uh, renewables. Uh, next slide. So I was asked to talk a little bit about uh, Western Resource Adequacy Program. Glad that Ryan was able to give the update. Um, and so some, some of this may be uh, uh, repeat here, but what I like about this slide is it sh not only shows the locations, but the names of all of the currently uh, participating um, uh, uh, utilities in the program. So next slide. Um, I just, I look at this often. <laughs> this is sort of a lineup of the, the three entities that are working on regional solutions right now. Of course, we've got the Western Resource Adequacy Program to the far left, the CAISO EIM, which is um, working on the day ahead market at this point, and the SPPRTO and the, their energy imbalance system, which they're also working on a day ahead market construct called Markets Plus. And so just kind of uh, good to always zoom out and take a look at what's happening in the region and where the overlap is. Next slide, please. And again, what, this is a good slide. What it shows in the SPP is you see all the red is one clearing area compared to what we have going on. Mm -hmm. So um, these next slides, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of what I see as the value proposition for the Western Resource Adequacy Program. We've been involved um, from early stages of development of the concept through um, development of the governance structure and uh, folks on my team serve on various committees in the program. And the things that uh, we really appreciate about this program are the voluntary nature of the program. Um, it's, uh, you know, obvious from Ryan's presentation that there's, you know, there's opportunity to take advantage of getting to know the program before committing to the binding program. And, um, and I think a lot of people are learning a lot about the program as they get involved and appreciate the transparency and the voluntary nature of it. Of course, we've talked about creating this opportunity across a broad region um, to um, share diverse resources and really, uh, really realize the diverse geographic diversity value of, of renewable generators in particular. And then, um, of course, the value of establishing the, the regional planning reserve margin, the bigger the footprint, the, the smaller the margin. Um, I think also uh, it's helpful for there to be consistency in the methodology that we use to determine capacity contributions. Of course, there are limitations when you have such a broad geographic region to consider, but I think there's been a lot of thought that has gone into how, how to create consistency here. Um, 
Another thing that's really important from our perspective is we feel like this, this, the, the, um, the process to bringing together the proposal here for the Western Resource Adequacy Program really was one of the first that brought together a very diverse set of stakeholders um, for you know a real tough conversations about like what are what are the problems we're trying to solve and what are the tools that we have to solve them and who needs to be at the table to have those conversations and how can we all come out of this at the end to be successful and we've really appreciated the ability to participate as a as a as a stakeholder in this process. Um, another piece, and I think uh, Ryan maybe is a little shy about talking about the um, the value of the information that's going to come out of this program. Uh, you know, there's going to be a lot of good information. There's there's been a lot of like um, speculation about what the region is going to be facing in the next several years around reliability and what um, what resource adequacy looks like. And so we'll actually get a lot of really good. Um, uh, discrete data that will help further drive programs like this. And then finally, and I think it's something that folks on this call are thinking about is this uh, bringing all these diverse uh, voices together and, and having this platform has, you know, created questions and um, ideas about how this entity in and of itself should evolve or whether they should be involved with conversations about full market development or what their role is playing. So it, it is providing a good platform for some um, some real thought around that issue. Next slide, please. Let me ask, as a clean energy advocate, um, because obviously wind and solar are intermittent, so they can't provide firm capacity 24 hours a day, you see the RAP program as a less cost way to integrate um, renewables that are intermittent? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, we, we have struggled, not when I'm not, when I'm saying we, the region has sort of struggled around establishing a capacity value for lots of resources, um, hydro resource being one of those, uh, and, and then the wind and solar resources, um, how to bring storage into that. And this has really opened up those opportunities to evaluate that. And so from our perspective, the, the RAP program provides a venue for the diversity value of renewable generators to be celebrated and, and to be um, part, of the, part of the important mix in, in ensuring capacity in the region. Um, so, you know, while there may not be a direct way for an IPP generator to sell into the program, it does elevate the importance of the capacity value to those, to those utilities that are considering purchasing new renewables on their system to participate in this program. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, just wanna throw this up here real quick. Uh, important things for us in considering, um, you know, our support for this program has been the robust governance structure that was created. Uh, happy to announce that the uh, nominating committee of which I'm a part of is very close to seating the very first new revamped board for the Western Power Pool, which will oversee this program. And I cannot even, I cannot like underestimate the, um, the, amount of very, very, very highly qualified individuals that put their name forward to be considered here. And so it just really brings, a, you know, it really highlights the importance uh, and, and everyone's thinking about these regional structures and these regional programs and the importance role that they play in, in the future of our electricity grid. So um, the uh, RAP will be overseen by an independent board, which also um, oversees several other programs that the Western Power Pool oversees, um, including a resource sharing program, there's a transmission planning program, the Northern Grid, and there's some operational programs as well. Um, there is a nominating committee which selects the independent board members we've been meeting over the last, last five months. Um, there is a uh, strong states committee. Uh, I think it was mentioned earlier that um, Laura mentioned the COSER. This is the Committee of States Representatives. 
is represented in this structure, as well as a um, sector-based participants committee. And the sector-based participants committee is an area where we've participated and um, Robin on my team is co-chairing that right now. And, um, you know, it's where we're gonna like roll up our sleeves and do a lot of the nitty gritty on evaluating um, some of the proposals from the participants committee and some of the some of the feedback that comes from the public on the program. Um, and then of course there's an independent program evaluator as well. Next slide, please. So um, I get asked this often and in fact, uh, <laughs> It was it was one of the interview questions that we asked of a lot of the candidates for the board position is, you know, what is the role that the Western Resource Adequacy Program should play in this market um, conversation? And I kind of want to take a step back and remind everyone that, you know, we, we as a region sort of agreed that incremental steps to regional market development was the way to go. And so, you know, if you if you look back, that's actually happening. We've got, you know, the energy imbalance market has been hugely successful. And now Kaiso is working on the day ahead market. And there's interest from SPP in establishing a day ahead market as well. But the, the Northwest was really narrowly focused on one of the really important things that comes with the regional market, and that's resource adequacy. And how could we do this outside of a full market construct and make it a successful program? Um, so, you know, it was really the idea that resource adequacy was, was a foundation piece of a good, effective regional market. Um, I, I think that a lot of people are thinking about this, where the RAP fits in. Um, I have here, you know, top critical minds thinking about how to meet ener clean energy goals and keep the lights on. You know, we, we kind of have to come back to why we're doing this. And, if this program is not successful in being able to fulfill its its own mission, and that is, you know, to create this capacity sharing program across a broad region, then it won't be successful doing anything else in the future. So it's really important to acknowledge that there's a big job ahead here for the Western for the Western Power Pool. I am 100% confident that the team has this, you know. Sarah and Ryan and all the others on the team are just really thoughtful and great about this work, but they have a really important job to do. So we do appreciate their focus on making sure the resource adequacy program is up and running and it's successful before we get too spread thin on other things. Um, we do think the right governance model is in place for this program. We think that it could probably evolve some to accommodate or it will need to evolve some to accommodate a, a regional market that includes transmission and, and other pieces. But we think it's a good base. And so we have confidence that if these conversations evolve here, that the right people are at the table and the right governance model is there to support it. And then the last piece I think is the most important here. And that's that I think whatever we do going forward, whoever moves forward first a regional market or whoever decides to take this on needs to keep the eye on the prize. And for us, the eye on the prize is that we end up with a market with greater reliability, a market that helps states which have them meet clean energy standards and goals and, and, um, and lower or keeping low costs for consumers. So every utility planning to join, whether that's Western Resource Adequacy Program or the, the Day Ahead Market, will need to demonstrate that value. How does the program achieve these goals, whether it's done on an incremental basis or, or all at once? So, you know, Arizona utilities deciding on whether to join Markets Plus or the, the RAP or EDAM will need to have this conversation. I think an unfortunate thing that's happened is that there's, there's a competition out there and our view from the outside looking in at some of the conversations that utilities are having, it, it appears that the decision on which market or program to join has sort of devolved in a way to tribalism. We see utilities banding together based on more ideological views of which group they feel like they fit in better with. But we have yet to see a utility come out and demonstrate the thought process behind which of these markets achieves those goals that I outlined. Where is the value proposition? So I, I, I always like to say like, let's keep the eye on the prize and remember that whatever decision we make going forward should fundamentally be about what's best for the consumers that these utilities serve. And I, 
I have confidence that these uh, that everyone's going to come to the table and make the right decision at the end. But I like to just bring it back to what is this problem we're trying to solve, and how can we be transparent and open about our thought process in solving that problem. Um, I think that's my last slide. Yeah. Well, thank you. I don't know if there's a question right now. I'm going to pull Stacy's slides up because I'm hoping uh, there'll be a robust discussion here at the end. So I don't know if anyone has a question of, of her or not. All right. Hang on. Slide two. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, wow. <laughs> there you go. Okay. I'm happy to explain it if you need some help. <laughs> I'm hoping I just hit the little arrow. Um, Vicki and I switched places so I could uh, be in front of her computer. So I'm Stacy Crowley. I'm the Vice President of External Affairs for the California ISO. Thanks for including me in today's discussion. Um, a lot of good uh, information and conversation has, has already occurred. So I am I have quite a few slides, but I really am not going to spend too much time on, on them. But I, I'm, I want to touch on just the success of the Western energy and balance market. The fact that we are looking at the day ahead market uh, now, as as others have said, and then obviously looking um, and with interest to what we do after that, whether it's a full RTO or something um, just short of that. So uh, just to summarize, um, the Western energy and balance market has been performing well and um, above expectations since it started in 2014. Pacific Corp was the first um, balancing authority and it's balancing authorities who actually join the EIM. Uh, they were the first in 2014 and then um, you'll see on that map there all those others who have joined since um, and have really benefited from um, not just the energy transfers but the um, collaboration between the utilities themselves. So a lot of dialogue that had never happened before is happening on best practices and things like that. So it's it's operational efficiencies, it's the economic transfers that are happening. It's also a reduction in GHG. We do track, um, we track that as, uh, because we've all heard that sometimes we have more energy than we need and we end up curtailing it. But if we can, instead of curtail it, ship it to other areas that need it for very, very low cost, um, it's a win-win. So it's been going very well. This is just a summary slide of the benefits. Um, it's hard to see all of the color blocks, but I highlighted the Arizona utilities benefits to date and in parentheses when they join. So that, that matters just in terms of time in the market. So APS joined first in 2016 and has done very well with um, $265 million in benefits. These are calculated, these are gross benefits that the ISO calculates um, per balancing authority uh, every quarter, and um, this is the, the tally that has occurred. And, and SRP joined in 2020, and they're at 110 million, and Tucson Electric um, joined this year and uh, are at 2.8. So we're really happy to have the Arizona utilities on board. I think they're seeing the benefits of, of their resource mix and how it works within the larger Western context. Um, we saw that, uh, we see that often when we have um, particularly stressful heat conditions and other conditions, um, uh, their resources were, were available. It wasn't as hot as they thought it was going to be down here last week. So um, thankfully they, um, they did provide power into the system to help others. So anyway, it's, it's done very well. Uh, and Stacy, yeah. just for perspective though, the energy imbalance market is real time, real which time. is a, a small percent in the market if you're looking at a five-year market or a two-year market or the day ahead market. So, I mean, can you project that there would be even greater benefits from day ahead and a forward market? Yes, there's been some studies to try to capture the benefits. We we believe that the the real-time market is about five to ten percent of market transactions, right? right? So, um, so you you can't probably make up a, a straight line projection, um, but um, there um, the, definitely the day ahead market would provide significantly more benefits, and then of course further um, when you're talking about long-term procurement decisions and things like that when you get into an RTO context. Just continuing on, this is a new diagram we started to show um, with this as transfers. And it's just meant to graphically show 
um, the transfers that occur within the Western energy imbalance market from left to right is where the transfers are going and you'll see um, how that moves. And it's really sort of all over the board, right? You have um, significant transfers across the system. It's a, it's a very well interconnected system. So um, just another, uh, another benefit. Interesting. Yeah. So as I said, we, we operate both the real-time market, which is the WEIM and the day ahead market. Um, and they, you know, they, they sort of get more granular as you, as you go in. So the day ahead market, uh, is really looking at scheduling units for that next day. And so that takes into consideration startup times and things that, um, really matter when it comes to large, large units and, um, and really what you're going to, uh, put forward the next day. We also have a better idea of what the weather is going to be like, you know, day before rather than multiple, multiple days out. So you put all of that, the forecast, expected load, expected resources into um, the mix, and you are able to identify um, what, what resources you, you want to put into the market. Um, then you get to the real time and you're really dealing with those kind of pluses and minuses that happen um, sort of unexpectedly, I guess, or uh, that, that differ from your day ahead projections. And that happens always, no matter what, no matter what resources are on the um, that are in the mix, um, weather and other conditions can happen. We saw that um, last week with the heat events, we had so much heat that it tripped resources. They just couldn't operate at those temperatures for that long. We had fires um, that um, uh, curtailed some transmission capacity. And so you just don't know what's gonna happen day by day. So that real-time energy market's important to be able to be flexible, to dispatch power where it's needed the most and, um, and get, get what we need to keep the lights on. As we look at exploring the day ahead market for um, the region, we're going through a stakeholder process. Um, I would say, I don't know if we're two thirds of the way through, but I feel like we are. We've done a lot of work with stakeholders, starting with just working groups, kind of figuring out what the key issues are and working um, with the stakeholders to develop the key components of the market design. Um, and to, to your question, Vicki, there is just, there is based on the, the um, real life work of the EIM and knowing what we know about the day ahead market, we know there are more benefits, right? We know that there are more cost savings because you have more efficient use of the resources that you've already procured through whatever procurement policy and mechanisms you have. Um, and you're able to optimize uh, the resources across that footprint. Um, we know that there are uh, the diverse resources in the West. We've talked about that and how beneficial that is in a market construct where you can really take advantage of the, of the weather patterns and the, and the resource diversity, the Northwest hydro, the, you know, we've talked about the intermountain winds, um, uh, geothermal, solar, uh, et cetera. So, um, and then again, the GHG uh, benefits as well. You're able to integrate more intermittent renewables, right? Clean energy, and you're able to um, potentially offset uh, more conventional resources um, due to the cost structure, the low cost structure and uh, reduced GHG emissions by not curtailing excess solar that a state or um, utility might have during, during the day. So all positive things. The um, evolution, I think Nicole said it very well that, that the West did kind of make the decision to take these incremental steps. It's allowed loud utilities and stakeholders to really understand what it means to operate in markets. You know, for so long, it was just California that had that had the market components. Um, so it, it's allowed for that training and understanding. Um, I think operators are finding real value in working in that real time time frame versus the hour. I think they were doing hourly blocks um, prior to the market. Um, and so the incremental um, approach has worked well for the West. And it's a diverse set of, of, of utilities and practices and policies. And so I think it's taken that kind of time to get warmed up. So we are um, confident that EDAM will move forward uh, and, and provide additional benefits. And we hope to kind of close that stakeholder process, um, wrap that up at the end of this year, or maybe early next, and, and uh, then file with FERC and then go through implementation there. All along the way, though, there's been an interest in talking more, right? Talking about a full RTO and what and what that means. 
uh, we have undertaken um, various looks at that in terms of benefits uh, and what that would mean, not just in the California footprint, but Westwide. Uh, someone mentioned earlier that Westwide study that Energy Strategies did for through a DOE grant for the states. And I think that was a really helpful tool in just understanding what the differences are between the markets, the day ahead market, and then that RTO, and what the potential benefits could be. We agree. We believe that there are more benefits to that deeper collaboration when you bring in transmission planning and long-term procurement strategies, and um, and we think there's benefits, and I and it can help states meet their goals more cost effectively, and utilities meet their goals more cost effectively. We, as you know. Um, have a governance structure that is uh, problematic to go to a full RTO. Our board of governors is independent in terms of financial independence from market participants, but they are appointed by the governor and confirmed by the state Senate. Um, we do have an energy imbalance market um, governing body, and I, I don't have a governance side, um, but uh, I, I thought I had a governance side, but the energy imbalance market governing body was created to provide that regional voice for the market that is now a regional market, right? The, the WEIM. And so that board is appointed through a stakeholder process, very similar to how uh, Nicole described the um, RAP board and other boards of that type. And that is going very well, very talented people sitting on both boards, um, but the EIM governing body has really um, facilitated um, that regional voice and the process is there. We have committees underneath that that are um, similar uh, to what Nicole described in RAP, but there's a states committee that's very engaged, a, a commissioner from each state, and we have three publicly public power liaisons on that committee as well. Um, they are being educated about markets. They're asking questions. They're um, providing uh, their opinion on some of our market design policies and governance policies. So it's Great to have them engaged. And then we have a regional issues forum that is meant to just be a, an open forum to talk about really anything that interacts with markets. Um, they can bring up any topics they like. They can provide advice to the board or the governing body or staff. Um, and it provides just another another venue for that. Stacy, two yep. questions on governance because yep. that is the elephant in the room. Yep. I mean, um, the, uh, governance process you have for EDAM, would that work for an RTO or would that have to be even uh, a wider um, non-state specific? If I may just kind of jump in with your own my question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, but, so what I have, what has kind of stopped me wondering is why hasn't the California ISO, and maybe this is the plan, just offer a non-California ISO that would just if you have scenes issues between the western states and California ISO but it would address California's concerns about expanding outside of California and governance. It would address the governance concerns of all the western states. So I mean is that is that kind of where we're headed with this because uh, of the board that you've been able to set up with the uh um, yeah so I'll try to answer both questions yeah. for um the for the we're looking at a, a revised governance proposal or governance structure for the day ahead market. It would essentially take what the governing body does now, increase their authority, right, to the day ahead market rules. Right now, the the Western um, Energy and Balance Market Governing Body has shared authority with the board over real time market rules. That would expand to day ahead market rules. That isn't enough to go to an RTO from what from what we know and what we've heard. Um, ideally, California sees the benefit of these markets as a whole versus an IS, uh, California footprint and a, the rest of the West kind of footprint. And we are looking um, to try to change legislation. It would take legislation to change, right? So that's ideal. And we're going to try that. And my last slide gets to that point. Okay, well, before you go, you yeah. So I'm a huge fan. So wouldn't it? Under an incremental approach, we set up the two RTOs eventually. Yeah, they could come together. Yeah. But really, merging would take place in California. By the That's right. That they're moving. But in the meantime, at least the Western states would have their own. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. That is the energy strategies picture. I don't know if it was market A or B, but that was shown earlier where California was kind of out of the whole big Western. Yeah, it's a technology platform, right? I can't speak to that. You know, it's going to take some time before California's ready to. Yeah, I, I'm optimistic. There's a lot that <laughs> I'm more optimistic. You're right. We we actually, the ISO offers a technology platform, right? And that platform yes. could operate in multiple footprints. And so I think that's definitely a possibility. Um, this just last slide is meant to show that we there is an attempt to try to get legislation next year. There is a sense that there's movement, right? So many things have changed. We tried back in um, 2015, 2016, and again in 2018 um, at the California legislature. So many things have changed um, that there is sort of momentum, I think, within the state to, to try to look at this again. So Assemblyman Chris Holden um, sponsored and passed a, a resolution to really raise that awareness, bring things back up to the front, uh, on this conversation with the with the legislature. Um, there will be, I think a third of the legislature is changing over in November. So we'll have to do a lot of education, but it's also a really good opportunity to say, here, you know, sort of fresh thinkers on this um, and really bring them up front. I just included a quote that Holden put in a press release that he put out on this, um, really committing to the fact that it's important to collaborate with Western states and how important it is for this to happen. Um, for California as well. So, um, and that would be the basis of possible legislation then? It would, yes, it would raise awareness. It would bring legislators up to speed on all that's happened. And then yes, be that impetus for legislation um, this coming year. So given the glazed yeah. eyes we get not only in here, but with commissioners and staff, I can't imagine the legislature is going to quite get it all. Well, it is complicated, right? <laughs> I, 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 that's the other. That's the other piece. We, you know, the governor is certainly um, going to be play a big role in this, and I think he's seen over the past couple months with the summer how important it is to collaborate with your yeah. neighbors and what that means um, to keeping the lights on in the state and yep. the, and the and frankly, financially, California consumers are paying a lot for their energy, right? And and um, there is a myth somehow that somehow. Arizonans are going to pay California rates. That's not true. In a market, you're essentially, it's just a wholesale market. The rate structure is still a state um, uh, developed structure. So the last slide you can just use when you hand out these slides sure, is just yes, a reference it's material. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so that's it. And I think Kathleen, okay. Well, thank you so much. And then we're going to have uh, Kathleen kind of wrap it up from a customer perspective. And I'm sure that there's been something in all of this quality information that will cause some good questions. If not, I, I have some very pithy ones. <laughs> um, okay, here, let's do it again. All right. So, so I have uh, no slides. So you I know, you guys I know. just yeah. get to. <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and all the junk on my computer. Oh, there it is. I can't see it. Like Thanks, Kathleen. All right. Those are my awesome. grandchildren behind there. Okay. They're adorable. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you guys for, um, for having me. And um, I wanted to sort of stay away from the technical stuff. So I, I don't repeat anybody, but really wanted to build on all of the comments that have been made so far. Um, and why this is important for customers. So just to sort of back up, Western Freedom is really a coalition of large commercial and industrial customers across the West um, who are interested in reliability, low and stable costs, and meeting their own clean energy and sustainability goals. So many of the, um, many of the customers that are within our coalition have pretty aggressive clean energy or renewable energy goals. Um, and they cannot, you know what, I'm going to actually turn my video off because my internet is unstable. So uh, God bless the internets. Um, th they are, so this is, this is, they're really interested in seeing more organized wholesale markets because they cannot 
meet their goals with the, the current bilateral market constructs that we have today. Um, you've seen the maps in, in the previous slides of how sort of fragmented we really are here in the West um, and, and even seen some of the numbers in those EIM numbers of how much benefit there is even in this first step with a real-time market. Um, and, and Vicky, your question of you know, increased benefits with the day ahead market, there's, a, there's yet another uh, big step of benefits uh, when we have a full RTO because of the additional components um, around balancing authority consolidation, uh, transmission planning and, and regional operation um, that will really, I, I think, demonstrate massive benefits uh, for consumers across the West. Um, from an from a economic and climate perspective. Um, so really what we're looking at is a, is a market uh, that can support the grid of the future. And I think it's important to note here that while there are you know, multiple other RTO structures in the country, um, we are, we're creating something new here in the West. We've got different, we've got a, a different geographic footprint. We've got diverse resources. Um, we have, you know, a lot of federal land, which makes things complicated. And then we have massive uh, political diversity as well. And so um, this opportunity to really create something that's going to achieve the, the diverse goals and the, uh, the resources of the future, I think is a, is a big opportunity, but is hard because we're in some ways making things up as we go along. Uh, for example, there are no standalone day ahead markets in the country. And so even the efforts to stand up Markets Plus and EDAM, um, in, in this hasn't been done before. So uh, learning from experience is, is hard. Um, so one of the things that, that Western Freedom is also doing is looking at some of those past efforts that Stacy mentioned and trying to figure out, you know, how can we learn from past efforts, what voices have been missing. And that's part of why uh, Western Freedom exists and, and is representing these large CNI customers because they didn't really have a voice in previous efforts. I think another area where we've seen um, some real opportunity to bring parties along that were not so engaged in previous efforts is in red states across the West. And so we are also really working to create a table where um, representatives, decision makers, policymakers from red and blue states across the West uh, feel welcome and feel like their interests can be heard. And so we've been working with organizations like Laura's at WEEB, we've been working with organizations like Nicole's with Renewable Northwest, um, and a lot of other organizations to make sure that we are uh, coordinating and bringing those different and diverse interests and voices to the table. Um, so I think we've got, you know, looking at some of these previous RTO efforts, that's part of why we are where we are with these day ahead markets. And I think there's a lot of, I've, I've heard a lot of questions about, well, isn't this just one incremental step? Why can't we just go to the full blown RTO now? Because there's going to be, you know, that we're going to in, incorporate all of the benefits from the day ahead market plus some with an RTO. And I think some of the challenges that we've seen in the West in actually getting this done uh, has sort of forced us to take a smaller step. And I think that's partly why uh, the success of these day ahead market developments are gonna be so important. Um, and I think, you know, adding on to what Stacy said with things being different now, uh, some of those dynamics that we see at this point that I think give a lot of people a lot of optimism and hope for um, success in the California legislature and really getting something done that can benefit the entire West is that we have um, more states and local governments and even utilities with clean energy goals than we have uh, during previous efforts. And so there's a, a driving force there, even in some states that don't have their own clean energy goals, the utilities that serve the bulk of the um, you know, residents and businesses in those states do have clean energy goals. And so there's, um, there is some need for something to change uh, to, to enable to, to reach those goals. 
We also have a massive investment opportunity for new clean energy and infrastructure projects through the IIJA and the uh, Inflation Reduction Act um, that have passed in the last year. So I think that's just the amount of funding that we have ahead of us to get these projects built and on the ground is really significant and creates a, a lot of momentum. Um, we've also seen success of the real-time markets, um, seeing that you know two billion plus in benefits just from the EIM and you know the the Weiss on the being offered from SPP just got off the ground a year ago. Um, but I think seeing those kinds of benefits uh, it has also demonstrated that we are that these steps are really have really tangible um, you know positive results for our for customers and consumers in the West. Um, I, I also, you know, be remiss to not mention the severe weather events that we're seeing and whether it's the heat wave in, in California or fires or drought, um, this is, there are no states in the West that will be immune from the, the more severe and intense weather patterns that we're seeing with, you know, change, change your thousand year flood to a, I don't know, every 20 years, Kind of thing and it's terrifying to think about. Um, we also have mandates on the books uh, in Colorado and Nevada for for the for utilities to join an RTO. So that's created a whole different set of, of pressure and momentum and momentum in those states, um, which I think is really kind of lit a fire across the West. Those states can't do it on their own. Um, and so utilities are really, I think, and, and other stakeholders um, have really gotten together and started to work really hard on what are some incredibly complex and challenging issues. So Kathleen, let me ask, because I want to make sure that uh, the two utilities have a couple minutes to um, opine as well. So from your perspective, you are seeing some uh, overcoming of the inertia through the legislation that puts a fire as you stated under the utilities to join an RTO, do you think in Arizona, something like that, if we could, I mean, what would we do differently to accelerate our efforts to have a full RTO in Arizona and the West, do you think? You know, I don't, I don't know that there are additional mandates that are necessary. And in fact, I think um, in my conversations with utilities across the West, you know, they're, they, I think they feel like you know, hey, there's an inevitability going on right now. We've got these, um, you know, these day ahead market constructs that are in development. The Arizona utilities are showing up and participating and in fact leading um, quite a bit of the, the efforts within both Markets Plus and EDAM. And so I think, um, I, I think the, the mandates would be, you know, almost an unnecessary fight. Um, and I think that, we're gonna. I think the the sort of encouragement of the efforts that are continuing to go from the rest of the stakeholders is gonna is will be more effective than a than a top down mandate would be, um, just from a political standpoint at this point in time. So I I think there's I, I think we have I just think so much has changed, um, it within these conversations and where who's participating. Um, and I think, frankly, there's a, you know, while the, while inertia is, you know, this, the the status quo and a fear of change are are really significant things. I think things are changing around us, and everybody's going to have to figure out how to change themselves to keep up with the, you know, whether it's the you know, the, the, the investment that's going to come from the federal government, or it's going to be these, these weather events, something has to give at this point. And I think there's enough momentum in these spaces that, that this is a direction that we're headed. Okay, thanks so much. And I, I want to uh, make sure we get uh, Brian Cole up. And then um, I don't know if Eric's going to speak or Sam, if you want to get him on, but uh, can we take it away, Brian? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Great, thanks. Appreciate it, Vicki. Uh, wow, uh, some really good speakers, some really good content. I'm gonna try to be as brief as possible with my comments because I think there a lot of things were really covered, but I'm gonna start it off with just one statement and that is it's different this time. I know a lot of people have been around 
since back in the Desert Star days. And I was tangential to that effort. And I know how plodding along that was. That is not today. Uh, you know, APS has a clean energy goal of 100% by 2050, 65% by 2035. And we know the only way to get there is to go through markets. And so we have three goals at APS, reliability, customer affordability, and integration of clean energy. And that's why we're doing uh, what we're doing in the market space. I do agree that, you know, I think we've realized in the West that incremental is the way we're going to get there. And so rather than fight it, we are supporting it and trying to move it forward. Um, you know, we're participating in RAP. We, we were uh, kind of the first in the Southwest to move that direction. Uh, obviously we're still trying to get additional entities within the Southwest on that same page. We think it's, uh, I think the word used by Nicole was foundational and I, and I agree completely. Um, you know, resource adequacy and being on the same playing field and understanding what the minimums are and, and how do you count things and, and having a common framework for that is really critical because you can come in in a very different space and then you've got leaning that goes on and that makes it very difficult uh, to have a market that's fair and equitable. So I think that's a great foundation. That's why we're part of it. Uh, we want it to continue to move forward and, and to continue to grow. Uh, we're also looking at both the CAISO's EDAM day head market, as well as SPP Markets Plus day head market. Uh, you know, Stacy gave a great update and the CAISO folks have been absolutely wonderful to work with. We continue to try to, you know, work out some details that have been uh, difficult. Uh, she mentioned governance and there's a few others, but everything's got issues. And so with SPP, we're working with them just the same and they've been great as well. Uh, but we want to get to a day ahead market. And so we'll continue to do that. And then we're even thinking beyond that at this point and talking about and trying to figure out, you know, what does it look like up to and including an RTO? And at the end of the day, it's going to be what's best for our customers. So uh, with that, I think I'll stop because I know we're running quite late on time. Well, let me just ask the um, Brian. Yep. Um, so I know as uh, there was an announcement that APS and others are uh, supporting the SPP Markets Plus effort, but eventually a decision would have to be made, right? So everything that you haven't invested in EIM, if you went to Markets Plus, you'd have to up and switch because you can't be in both. Is that correct? Well, yeah, you're, you're right. You have to go in one or the other, and you can't be in one day ahead market and one real-time market. Right. So you need to be in one or the other to make that work. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, the, and I want to be clear with this group, the commitment we made was not that we're going with SPP. The commitment was that we're going to continue to work with them in order to push that option forward to make sure we see what's best for our customers. But we're also at the same time working with Kaiso. And frankly, the letter that we sent to them said just that, that we're going to continue to work with both. Uh, I know press releases don't always come out the way... Uh, uh, they maybe should, but uh, just to be clear with this group, that's what our uh, letter said, and that's what the intent was. So we'll continue to work with both. Interesting. And maybe the best of will end up being what is. Right. I mean, whatever the best answer for our customers is, is, is where we'll be. Mm -hmm. now, I don't know, um, Sam, I don't see Eric on. Do you want to say anything on behalf of TEP? Well, he's supposed to be on, but he's not on. Let me ask a question. Yeah, I, I'm here. I'm trying to get, uh, there we go. I was trying to turn off camera and um, and the mute. He said he's going to join on my phone. Yes, he, he we've been texting a little bit. He will join for the, the vote that the, the board is okay. gonna take, but he's Got gonna it. go ahead and continue okay. with the comments. Okay, go ahead. So, I, I do not have prepared comments, but I, I will comment on the, the topics today. Very interesting presentations. I think thank you all uh, for allowing me to be here and for uh, participating. Um, I, I do want to say a couple things on, on the uh, wrap. Yes, we are definitely interested in um, moving in that direction. We did not elect to participate initially because we just joined the energy and balance market, and that required a lot of our resources to be dedicated to uh, an EMS change out and putting, uh, standing up the market. We, we had a, a new campus building project. There was a lot going on that we just didn't have the resources to put towards a very data intensive wrap. So um, 
we're we're interested in moving in that direction, and uh, a lot of our work is behind us. Um, uh, so we'll we'll have more discussions on that. Um, also, uh, the, similar to what Brian had commented on, um, we do have energy uh, clean energy goals. Uh, and those are spelled out in our uh, IRP. Um, we have a cleaner, greener grid committee to help move us in that direction. Uh, so, um, uh, it, it, as far as markets are concerned, um, you know, there, there's a natural evolution. We just went from bilateral trading into the imbalance market, where we're exploring. We're part of the exploratory group on on moving to the day ahead. Very interested in that. Um, and, and and all the way to the RTO, there are a lot of factors to consider. And uh, so we, we need to do our diligence um, in moving in that direction. Um, but yeah, and acknowledge that you know, as you go farther and farther toward the RTO, there is more savings. But again, um, the, the, uh, the least of which governance is gonna be a big part of that. So um, uh, that's kind of a, in maybe in a nutshell where TEP stands. And um, again, uh, just let me know when it's time to pull Bronner in. Okay. And I'll do that. I have well, to pull him out of another uh, meeting he's in. I, I am I am very encouraged uh, by uh, especially Brian and other statements that this is not Desert Star. I I might have I might have a few wrinkles since I was involved in that <laughs> because it was so many decades ago. But uh, it is good to know that we we're, we're on a more of an accelerated pace, and I think with the human huge amount of savings staring us in the face. How can we not on behalf of citizens and um, even like what happened with uh, not only did California use conservation efforts, but just the ability of, of Arizona to contribute to help out, uh, help out our neighbors. And maybe one day, I know this is kind of a nerd thing to say, but, you know, maybe counterflow will be considered instead of contract path because, you know, oh, yeah. if you're going there's, the whole initiative way, on that. there's room. Right. So, uh, so, so more good things to come. Um, any final questions? Because we have to get to our uh, formal board meeting, and I'll stop the recording at that time. And again, we'll have it available as well as the slides because some of this takes a while to sink in, and I'll send that out afterwards. Uh, any other questions? Well, thank you all so much, uh, really, for your time and effort in that, and then. Uh, We'll hear even more from Cal ISO uh, September 21st. And uh, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll take a one minute break and go into the formal meeting. Thank you all. <laughs>